Would you pray with me? Father, um, we come. Though sinful uh, we be in our, in our own righteousness, Lord, there is none that we have to bring. There's nothing that we have to bring to you. There's nothing about us that you would look to and see uh, as being exceedingly worthy, valuable. Lord, all we have is filth to bring. But how deep is your love for us? It is a love that we cannot understand to its depths. We can certainly understand it. And that's, that's the whole point of the book of 1 John is that we can know. That we get to know. We don't have to be left wondering. We don't have to be left scratching our head trying to figure out what you have to say. But you know. That we, we can know how deep your love is for us. And how deep the love, not only of you, our Father, but how deep the love the Lord Jesus Christ has for us. And how deep the love we have that the Spirit has for us, that the entire Godhead has for us. Not because... We are worthy, but because you are gracious and merciful and kind and that you have chosen to save for yourself a people out of every tribe, tongue, and nation. <coughs> so, Father, as we dive uh, into uh, the book of First John, would you give us ears to hear? eyes to see, hearts to receive your word. Spirit, would you move among your people? And would you move among this city that even tonight that those who are currently cursing the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you would begin working in them and bringing them uh, to a place of repentance and a place of faith when they hear the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus being proclaimed. Oh Lord, work. And we ask this not for our sake, but for the sake of your Son, would you go before us and move in this city. We ask this in Jesus' name. So, um, tonight we begin our, our study of the book of 1 John. Um, I've had uh, the, the, one, the wonderful thing about working in Jerome is it takes like 20 some odd minutes to get there, um, which many go, that's a long time to drive. Um, but when you've crossed the country a number of times, what's 20 minutes? Um, so I've had the privilege uh, and the honor that as I'm going back and forth, uh, I get to hear, listen to First John like four times a day, um, just sitting there and hearing the word. Um, and it's been, what a rich blessing it is to have uh, that we live in a day and age that as we travel distances uh, such as that, that we can hear God's word while we drive. So uh, as a plug, I would say this, redeem your time in the car. If you, don't have a, yeah, if you don't have a good Bible on CD or something, get one. Do yourself a favor. You know, why not have a blessing while you're driving the car? And, uh, and hear God's word. So um, tonight what we will be doing uh, is 
it's a little more academic in its approach. Um, I will uh, have us read uh, from uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. So if you would uh, stand with me in the honor of reading God's word. Um, and then we'll trek along. Uh, the first letter of John, chapter 1, verse 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard. What we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Uh, may God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So, so the approach that we'll, we'll take tonight, um, and that, we'll, that we're going to take uh, throughout this, uh, this time, uh, to explore this wonderful section of scripture will be one in which we will do our best, okay, uh, our best. Um, even then, uh, we will probably only be scratching the surface of the depths of God's word. Uh, the more that I've been listening to it and reading it and just trying to go, God, what are you saying in this book? The more I'm going, there's so much to this that you know, we will have eternity to explore and never reach the depths. Uh, but the, the approach that we're going to take is going to do our best to cover each and every verse of the Apostle John's first epistle. That we're going to go through this, we're going to work um, hard at trying to understand what God has said and what he is saying today in his word. Uh, and we will do this uh, by, in order to accomplish this task, what we're going to do is it's going to take us about 20 or so weeks. Um, mapped it out, you know, looking at it, and figured out where, where do we sit. But it'll take us about 20 or so weeks, if the Lord so wills, uh, to go uh, thought by thought, section by section, verse by verse. Uh, this means a study, is an, it's an obvious expectation that we have uh, coming from the body known as Eastside Baptist Church. We expect that, and that's a great expectation to have, that we would hear nothing less than the Word of God, uh, that we would hear nothing less uh, than what God has to say, that we're not here to hear what Paul Thompson or Mark King or uh, uh, John Martinez or uh, Greg Mooring has to say. Quite honestly, I'm glad you guys don't even care what we have to say, what we have to, what we want to hear is God. What does God have to say and the expect, and, and how we will go about doing that is to go thought by thought, section by section, verse by verse. Now this, again, it's, it's obvious that we already have this, but again, I do believe that it is important for us from the outset to remind us of this method in order that we would all be on the same page. That you, that as, as our sending church, as our mother, that you would know what to expect from behind this pulpit. That as you send us off, as you send off whatever becomes of this, that you would know that you are sending out a faithful daughter. One that is concerned with the word of God. So it is an, it's important that we be on the same page. Uh, and with the stage being set of how we're going to advance through this book in its entirety tonight, what we're going to do is cover a general introduction uh, to the book of 1 John. Uh, and what we will discuss uh, tonight is, is the author. I know, this, it's like, this is so elementary. We know it's John, but why do we know it's John? What is it when somebody comes up to us, especially living in the community that we live in, that questions this, the validity, the historicity of scripture? 
that goes and says, oh, oh, it's been corrupted, so let's give, a, give you another testament. We need to know why we believe what we believe. So we're going to cover the author, the date, the setting, the purpose, the themes and interpretive challenges that are in 1 John. That it is important that we know that, you know, we come to books of the Bible and we know this as we read. That there are things within scripture that we read and we go, what is that about? I don't quite get that. And it lets you in on a little secret. If you don't already know this, your pastors have that same problem. Going, what? (laughs) What is God saying? So we're going to cover all of that. Uh, again, I admit that this is going to be much more academic in scope, uh, but again, I believe, I really do believe that for such an intensive study, it is absolutely necessary uh, for us to have all of these things in mind in order to faithfully uh, exposit and exegete, and that is to, to unveil what God has saying, to understand the book as to what is actually being said, not what I think it says, but what it is saying. Because quite honestly, I don't care what I have to think about it. What I want to know is what hath God said. Uh, That in order for us to do that, doing this sort of uh, academic thing is important uh, for us to uh, be faithful to the text and for us to be faithful hearers of the word. So the first thing I want us to consider is who is the author of the book? Uh, I admit that this may seem like again, it's a lesson. In, it seems like a lesson in futility. But if we are attentive readers, you notice that the, the verses one through four that is the the prologue of the book of First John. It's his introduction. Normally, you look at uh, Paul's letters, and he boom right at the beginning, right from the outset, he introduces his Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or you know, some variant of how he would say that. And in this, this day, uh, the epistle, the, the, um, that realm of literature uh, called the epistle, you would have that introduction as to who wrote the letter and some greetings and all of that stuff. We don't find that here. It is not mentioned at all. Nowhere in the book, he doesn't even say sincerely, the apostle John. It's not there. Um, Rather, we actually just assume uh, that the author of this letter was the Apostle John. I mean, it says it's the first letter of John, so I mean, that's got to be part of the book when the title that we've given it is not. When it was written, it wasn't given the first letter of the Apostle John to the church in Ephesus or whatever. So, um, we assume this even without there being a formal naming of the author. John does not introduce himself in this. Um, so why do we do this? Why is it that we find it absolutely acceptable that this is written by John? Why do we accept this letter as having been written by him? And it, versus we see something like the book of Hebrews and we accept an anonymous author that we're like, we don't really have any idea who, who wrote Hebrews. Some say Paul, some say Luke, some say, I think, Silas. Um, not Bianca Silas, but, um, but, uh, we, but we accept John as having been written by John and Hebrews being anonymous and being okay. Either that we accept this and accept that, but why? Um, What is it that would lead us to conclude that this was written by John? Uh, John MacArthur notes this, uh, that uh, the epistle does not identify the author, but the strong and consistent and earliest testimony of the church, so our forefathers, our ancestors, ascribe it to John the disciple and apostle. Uh, This anonymity strongly affirms the early church's identification of the epistle with John the Apostle, for only someone so knowledgeable and well-respected as John would be able to write with such unmistakable authority. You can't, when you read 1 John, there, you talk about authority that comes in and he lays it out. You got to have some authority from somewhere. And it makes sense that this would be 
John. Um, that, so for only someone so knowledgeable and well-respected as John uh, would be able to write with such unmistakable authority, expecting complete obedience from his readers without clearly identifying himself. He was well known to the readers, so he didn't need to mention his name. They knew this was John. They go, if he's got to say it. And he knew that you know, his role as an apostle, there was the expectation that what he would write, they would obey. Because he, being the last living disciple, the last living apostle, he's got some weight to his words. And they knew it. So early church tradition, it affirms John as the author. And if this is true, and I do believe that it is, such an attestation makes sense of the demands that are made in this book and why the author could write in chapter 4, verse 6, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So this author is so bold to say that the, uh, the, the that obedience to what he has to say and write is lockstep in is in lockstep with obedience and expressive of one's relationship to God Himself, because the author is a representative sent from the Lord Jesus. So he is saying that if you're from God, you will hear us, you will listen to what I have to say. If you're not from God, you won't listen to it because you're not from God, and we are. So what he, he says here is that obedience to what he has to say is, is expressive of one's salvation uh, and that it is um, even expressive of you know, one's relationship to God. That if you hear what first John has to say and you, what John has to say in this letter and you do not obey it, you're not saved. Uh, is what he you know, comes in and says, and you cannot speak with that kind of authority unless you're an apostle. So uh, the only ones, again, with such authority were the apostles. So this, this comes with this, this air of apostolic authority. So logically, the writer must, then, must have in some way apostolic authority. And our ancestors affirmed that the apostle that wrote this was the book, was John. So the early church tells us this was John. Our tradition tells us this was John. That we can look back at the records and say this was John. And it makes sense. You can't write this way. You can't write the stuff that John writes in here and be me. If I wrote this and I came to you and said this, and this is, you better get rid of me fast. But if you're the apostle, John, you better listen to him. Because he's been endowed with authority by the Lord Jesus himself. So, additionally, uh, the content, the style, and the word choice uh, is indicative of the letter's author. Um, again, before we get into next week, which we will cover uh, chapters chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, uh, and we're going to dig into the prologue and how that points to us uh, the incarnation and how uh, absolutely important it is to get the incarnation right and understand who it was that's in the incarnation, understanding Jesus rightly. It's what separates lost from saved. That's why we look at the Mormons and say, you're not Christian. You don't understand the incarnation rightly. You don't understand Jesus rightly. And so we see, but that's preview for next week. Um, if the Lord so wills and he tarries. Um, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it carries with it this very same flavor and aroma of John 1. So, you know, we hear, so... You know, what was from the beginning and what we have heard. We, we hear that in uh, 1 John 1. But then when we listen to uh, John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That, we, that it, it carries with it. That you go, seems like the same guy. Uh, so uh, 
Furthermore, if we compare chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 with John chapter 19, verses 25 through 26 and verse 35, we find very similar language that points us to the truth that the same person who wrote the gospel according to John, or as we know it as the gospel according to John, is the very same person who wrote 1 John. That this is all the Apostle John, that, that the language, the content, the style is very much the same as John's gospel. Furthermore, the, the emphasis in 1.1 on authoritative proclamation and eyewitness testimony is most naturally seen as a reflection of John's apostolic calling. That the way that he writes, that I'm coming to you testifying that you listen to me because I'm an eyewitness, that I have an authority that doesn't come from this dude over here or because of anything else, but I have seen him. I have touched him. I have learned from him. That all of that stuff that you see, that what he's coming in and he is uh, saying that, hey, my testimony is true. Especially in light of what he has to combat in this letter, it is absolutely imperative that this, that he start off this way. That he be able to come and say, you need to listen to me. What I'm about to deal with that's going on in the church over here, listen to me. I'm an eyewitness. I mean, if we're in a court of law, we know that eyewitness testimony is a pretty big deal. It is a big deal. Not hearsay. This isn't hearsay. Quite honestly, it's, it's not me. It's not Greg coming up and giving this sort of declaration. I wasn't an eyewitness. I read this and accept it in faith that this is true. But the Apostle John goes and says, I've seen it. And so for him to come in with that, again, the, the language of this introduction alone, it screams apostolic authority. So long story short, the author of 1 John is John. That's why we call it 1 John. Uh, since then, uh, we have established that the Apostle John is the author of this letter. Uh, let, we must then focus our attention on when the letter was written. What is it? When, what is the date of this? It is important to note that as we work to establish the date of the letter, it will also help us understand the setting in which it was written and the purpose for which it was written. Okay? Getting the date right helps us understand why. Why was this written to begin with? Okay? Why was it that the Holy Spirit moved the Apostle John at this particular time? Well, it's because it was happening at a particular time, that there was something going on. So just as determining the author has its, its minor struggles, there are minor struggles in that. Um, determining the date of the book also has minor struggles. It's, not a, it, it's very easily overcome. Um, the reason for these troubles is simply because there's nothing, again, just like there was no author stated, there's no date given in the book. There's nothing indicative at, that we would be able to look at the uh, book itself and that it would point us to a historical point of reference. There isn't anything in there that would say this is the date. It, it, there isn't anything, uh, you know, just as the book doesn't start off by going, hey, everyone, this is the Apostle John writing to you. Likewise, the book doesn't say, hey, everybody, this is uh, the Apostle John, and I'm, I'm writing to you in the month of January uh, during the fifth year of uh, Caesar so-and-so. We don't get anything like that. It's not mentioned. Um, now, although we don't have anything so explicit, which, you know, of course, anytime we have one of those, you know, we read the Bible, it would be really great if each and every book had, had that. Each and every verse would give us something like that. But then even if it did, People would still argue with it. People would still go, well, that's, that didn't happen. You know, sinners can't be pleased. Um, and again, although we, we don't have anything like that, uh, we're not left without the ability to determine the time in which uh, John wrote this epistle. Again, MacArthur notes this, that most likely uh, John composed this work in the latter part of the first century. 
uh, church tradition consistently identifies John in his advanced age as living and actively writing during, the time, uh, during this time at Ephesus. Uh, the tone of the epistle supports this evidence since the writer uh, gives the strong impression that he is much older than his readers. Uh, how often does he say, you know, young children, or little children, young, you know, young men? You know, it, he uses a certain language that carries with it that he's, a, he's an older man, a much, a substantially older man than the audience. Uh, additionally, we find similar uh, diction and syntax as John's, Gospel's account, John's Gospel account, uh, which again, we know that was written later in John's life. Thus, it leads us to affirm a date where John wrote this epistle, followed by his other letters after the writing of his Gospel. So, something happens later, so in the 90s, John writes his Gospel, declaring the Gospel. Uh, his account of the gospel. And then it's after that he comes and he writes First John, which kind of almost works as an application commentary on the book of John. Uh, another point uh, that is to be made is that when determining the letter's date, that is, is that there is no mention of the per persecution that began in AD 95 under the emperor uh, Domitian, uh, who we've all heard of Nero, Domitian, if, I, if my memory serves me right, that was worse than Nero. Um, so when we take all of these uh, pieces of information into consideration, we can confidently conclude uh, the date of the letter to be somewhere between 8090 and 8095. So a five-year range in there. That's a pretty good, it's not like it's 8060 and 8090. That's a, that'd be a big gap. But So we're thinking 90 to 95. Um, over 1900 years ago. Uh, it was also around this time that the beginnings of what we know of n as uh, Gnosticism. See, this is why it's important to, know, to figure out the date because then it tells us what we're dealing with. What is John attacking? Who is he addressing? What, it, what heresy is it that has him write what he has to write? It's at this time uh, that Gnosticism uh, begins to rear its ugly head, that it's beginning to come about, which, of course, the world wants us to accept Gnostic accounts and Gnostic Gospels. No. Um, and we see, especially as uh, ferociously as John attacked it, there's a reason why we, you will not find the Gospel of Thomas in the Bible. Um, so, uh, for those unfamiliar, again, with the basic premise of Gnosticism, I'm not going to assume that we all know Gnosticism. Um, Ronald Sauer, who's a uh, professor at uh, Moody Bible Institute, he notes this, that its basic premise, the basic premise of Gnosticism was a sharp dualism between spirit and matter. Uh, the spiritual was regarded as divine and good, while the materialistic was, de was deemed created, though not by God, and evil. We, we actually kind of unfortunately have this sort of divide uh, in Christianity today when we, when we talk about the sacred and the secular that we want to sit there and play around with and say, well, there's that sacred stuff and then there's the secular stuff and, you know, this one's way more holy than this when, in fact, the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the Lord of all the earth. There is no sacred and secular divide. It's all the Lord's. And Gnosticism, what it would do is it would take what we, what we have done and takes it even further and say that the flesh, everything within um, the mater materialistic world, anything that was matter was evil and the spirit was only good. Um, and within Gnosticism, there are actually two uh, sort of strains. You have the... Uh, the Docetic, uh, Docetic uh, strain and the Cerinthian uh, strain. Uh, Sour continues in saying this, that Gnosticism denied uh, the incarnation for a pure spirit like God could uh, have nothing to do with evil matter, such as the human body. Therefore, the human body, the, its existence was evil. Uh, and often they would even uh, teach that the God of the Old Testament, which again, we, we get these ridiculous divisions that get created, that the God of the Old Testament 
uh, was this evil, wicked creator God, because matter's evil, therefore the one who created it must be evil himself. And then the God of the New Testament, as seen in Jesus, you know, comes in and rectifies the situation. It's wackadoodle, to say the least. Um, but so Gnosticism, it offered two possible solutions to the problem of this supposed evil of evil matter and good spirit. Uh, the uh, Docetic Gnostics denied Jesus' humanity. Uh, he only seemed to be human. No, he really wasn't human. He just kind of seemed that way. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this, this was an attempt to preserve Christ, the the Christ, and I'll, I'll refer to it this way, the Christ's deity at the expense, at the expense of his humanity. The other solution was uh, Serenthian Gnosticism. It maintained the earthly Jesus was nothing more than a human being upon whom the heavenly Christ, or Logos, uh, descended at his baptism, but then left him prior to the cross. I don't know where they even can come up with that idea. Uh, outside of pulling it out of their back pocket. Um, this was an attempt to preserve Jesus' humanity at the expense of his deity. Also, according to the Gnostics, sin was a matter of the evil flesh from which they had been supposedly liberated from the flesh. And sin was not a matter affecting the noble spirit into which their knowledge had allegedly brought them. They had reached a higher knowledge where even the sin that their flesh would partake in was of no deal, big deal to their spirit. So moral conduct was an unnecessary issue to discuss. How convenient that you can separate those things. Well, I can do whatever I want because it doesn't affect my noble spirit. It's just the flesh that's going to do that. So you can do anything you want. And it doesn't matter. See, these people, uh, they directly attacked the truth of who Jesus is, and they also attacked how believe, believers are supposed to be conducting themselves in this present evil age. I mean, it's quite obvious. When you attack who Jesus is, you can't help but naturally attack the way we're supposed to live in light of who Jesus is. If Jesus is nothing more than a man, and that the Christ whatever that would be, just descends on him at the baptism and then departs while he's being crucified or that he just seemed to be human. When you begin to attack who Jesus Christ is, it is going to impact how we live. There's no way around it. If you get Jesus right, if you have the right Jesus, he makes demands. You start messing with who he is, you can adjust anything he says. You know, we, we see that. So when we come to this letter written by the disciple whom Jesus loved, we find an old man who has been faithful for many decades. Uh, he is the last living apostle living in and serving the church in and around Ephesus just before the persecution spurred on by the emperor Domitian. It is at this time that John... Uh, then has to refute and condemn a vile and dangerous heresy that is attacking the true humanity and, and the true divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of these attacks on the truth of who Jesus is, the church is being taught a false knowledge. Oh, would you hear us? Oh, we've got this knowledge that you just need to hear. All that stuff you've been hearing. It's, you know, it's been corrupted. Let's tell you the true knowledge. Because that's what gnos you know, gnosis means. Gnosticism means knowledge. So they come in and he's saying, hey, just come and hear us. I mean, let's see, 600 AD we heard, you know, a guy that was stuck out in the desert going away. Hey, the, the church is corrupted, so God has to fix things and brought me new revelation. You know, in 1800s America, some guy in, you know, out of New York decides, hey, I've been given golden plates, and I've, been given, you know, I've got a knowledge that you need to hear that has been lost for the last 1,800 years. 
Or, you know, in this case, we have the Gnostics who are so close to the time of Christ. Oh, the last 60 years, mm, the knowledge has been lost. Let's give you the true knowledge. Let's teach you something. And so John comes in, and he's he is bearing witness of the truth against this false knowledge that calls into question these believers' salvation and calls into question their sense of security in their salvation, and it is directly leading people into a life of sin. There are some very major issues. These are some very major issues that the Apostle John has to deal with, especially since he is all that remains of the Apostles. That's a pretty heavy load when you think about it. Someone must stand up against the satanic attacks on Christ and his church, and it is the Apostle John who has been appointed for such a time as this. The, the Apostle John was living at this time for this very reason, to defend the truth of the gospel. And being that we have established who the author is, when it was written, and the setting uh, from which this letter comes, what then is the purpose of this letter in particular, and what are some themes that are contained herein? What is interesting is that if John is directly addressing uh, the beginning stages of what uh, would be called Gnosticism, then he does so by presenting it what is true knowledge. See, they come, the Gnostics came in, and they're like, we got this knowledge that you've got to have. And so what John does is he comes in and goes, oh, you want knowledge? I'm going to give you the true knowledge, the real knowledge, the knowledge that was given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. There are 40 times oh, and the New American Standard uh, uses the word in, in 1 John, uh, uses either the word no or knows. In 25 of those times, the Greek word uh, gnosko, which refers to an intimate knowledge, is used. Okay, So gnosko, this, this uh, intimate knowledge, not just like a head knowledge, but this is an intimate knowledge. It's often, um, it would be a word that you would use uh, referring to a husband and wife, you know, to know one another, that there's an intimate knowledge. Don't go any further with that. Um, but that what he's he does in here is that he says that there is intimate knowledge of Christ in the believer. So that all being said, that it, it, it is as if the Apostle John is coming in and he's saying, hey, you've got these people who purport to have true knowledge. They've got knowledge. They're really knowledgeable. But what has been delivered to you by the Apostles and Christ himself is what is true. Trust that. That knowledge that you have had passed down to you Trust it. So it's for the purpose of uh, refutation of heresy and encouragement in the truth that John writes his letter. More specifically, in pursuit of this purpose, John gives five objectives for why he writes this letter. In First John, uh, in John, or in Vlada, we're in John, First John, we know that. In chapter 1, verse 3, John writes this. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. John's primary reason for why he proclaims and reaffirms the apostolic truth of the gospel is so that there would be fellowship amongst believers in the truth. So the overall trajectory of the letter is that I'm coming to you the, as the apostle John. That what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us and with his son. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. That, he's, that his overall reason for this is so that we would have a relationship with ourselves, with amongst believers in Jesus Christ. And relate, our relationship indeed is with God because of the truth of who Jesus is. There's no other, in, we, we take the, the inevitable conclusion then is outside of a true knowledge of who Jesus is, there is no salvation. There is no possible way that we can be saved, that we can say that we have been restored to God, that I know God if we don't know the right Jesus. It matters. 
It absolutely matters who you believe Jesus to be. The second objective, which is kind of, if you want to say, overall traje- uh, the overall objective would be this. But the reason he specifically comes and says, these things we write. Uh, for this, he says in uh, one, verse 4, he says, these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. It, is, he come, it sounds a little selfish, but it's not. He's going to say, I'm writing these things so that our joy, as an apostle, that my joy would be fulfilled in you, that our joy together would be complete. It is for his joy and the joy of believers that John writes his letter, that knowing who Jesus is results in joy. There is no joy outside of Jesus. Thirdly, he, John writes, my little children, I am writing these things so that you may not sin. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, with the aggressive false teaching of Gnosticism, there was the downplaying of sin. How do we, do we see that today? That there's a downplaying of sin. And the apostle writes to ensure that Christians will not fall back into a life of sin. Jesus died to save you from your sin. Why would you go back? And that's what he's going on. I'm writing to you. Don't listen to these people who are attacking who Jesus is and are leading you down a path of sin. I'm writing to you so that you would, not only would our joy be made complete, but that you, so that you may not sin. Jesus died for that. Don't go back. Fourthly, John states, these things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Oh, don't talk about, don't name teachers by name that are preaching false doctrine. That's a taboo in Christian, the Christian world. John doesn't care. In fact, John goes, I'm, I'm writing to you because of those people who are trying to deceive you. It is not worth you losing your joy. It's not worth you going into sin for you to sit back and hear this garbage. So, the aggressiveness with which the false teachers come, so does the Apostle John. He comes back hitting harder. So John, he writes to fight heresy, which maybe that's something we should learn. That when there's heresy, we don't put up with it. Even if it's in our own camp that we love, we must speak out against it. Fifthly and finally, John declares, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. John wants to ensure that Christians are settled in the knowledge that they are saved. That he comes in, he's writing what he's writing. He goes, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you might guess, that you might think that, nah, Are you feeling that way today? No, but that you would know that you have eternal life. John wants to ensure that Christians are settled in that knowledge. See, heresy, heresy is a very dangerous and deadly thing. And the Apostle John writes this letter to combat heresy and encourage believers to continue trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as he has been truly revealed. And in that trust, comes the knowledge and the the belief and the the assurance of one's salvation. Because it's not based on you. It's based on the one in whom you believed. As we sang earlier, I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to keep that which I have entrusted to him until that day. But when you come in and you start messing with who Jesus is, you don't have that. You can't say that. That's why you you get a Mormon who says, oh yeah, I believe Jesus, but not the right one. And because you don't believe in the right one, you go, no, I I don't know if I've pleased God enough. You know, is my special underwear 
clean enough? You know, am I reading enough? Am I doing enough to earn his, sal you know, his, his favor? That's what happens when you get the wrong Jesus. But when you got the right Jesus, you come in and you go, I literally am bringing nothing but garbage and he's giving me salvation. That he's giving me forgiveness because of who he is and what he has done, not because of me. Because if it was based on me, I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't have any hope. The major theme of this book, then, is the assurance of salvation, whereas uh, John's gospel was evangelistic. We see that in John's gospel. He goes, these things we've written. He right at the end, I think it's John 20, he goes, these things have been written so that you would hear and you would believe in Jesus. Whereas John's gospel was evangelistic to bring people to saving faith in Christ. In contrast, the major purpose of 1 John is to provide reassurance to his readers of their salvation. How believers in Christ may know that they and not the heretics who withdrew from them. Because that's the thing, the people that withdrew from the church were like, we've got the right knowledge. We're the ones who have been accepted by God. And so you're going to have, I mean, imagine you start seeing swarms and swarms of people leaving and going, but man, they were just singing with us last week. And they're leaving. And they're saying they've got the true salvation. What John's doing in this case is he's coming in and saying, hey, I want to let you know they don't have eternal life, but you do. Because you have believed in the right Jesus. Also, the book uh, thematically focuses on fidelity to the basics of the Christian faith, which in turn results in happiness, holiness, and the assurance of salvation. Um, one commentator wrote here that a proper belief in Jesus produces obedience to his commands. Obedience issues in love for God and fellow believers. Uh, where... When these three, sound faith, obedience, and love, operate in concert together, they result in happiness, holiness, and assurance. Uh, they, can, they constitute the evidence, the litmus test of a true Christian. Some final themes uh, found in this book, if, again, if you haven't already figured this out, um, would be that the calling out of antichrists and a call to love God and to love his people. Uh, the final thing uh, to mention about this beloved letter uh, is the variety of interpretive challenges that are found here. I'm just going to mention what they are um, without getting into interpretive stuff because that will be later. It will be like 15 weeks from now. Um, so uh, one challenge uh, is, is a verse like uh, chapter 3, verse 6, where it is written, No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. So the question is, is John making a claim to perfectionism? There are people who would believe that. So what is he doing there? Um, another problematic passage is chapter 5, verse 16, where we are told there is a sin leading to death. But it doesn't go on to explain what the sin is leading to death. Uh, so what is it? Also, uh, there can be trouble with how rigid John is in the presentation of his theology in such stiffness you'll have unlearned and corrupted men who can and do abuse that. That they will take that and they will abuse what is said there to then actually berate Christians and cause them to doubt their salvation. Which is the exact opposite of what John wrote for. Um... So finally, the, the repetition of similar themes can make it a difficult task for the interpreter, simply because it, it, things just keep getting repeated and repeated and repeated. You're going, I've already talked about this. So um, there's, that, again, those are just interpretive challenges that we have to address. Uh, so as we come uh, to a close tonight, what I pray is this, is that the information that has been shared, and again, I know this is much more academic in scope than uh, what we would see uh, next week. Okay, when we are digging into the text and we are able to say, thus says the Lord. Um, it is my prayer that it will be a benefit not only to your brain. Okay? It can't just be here. It cannot be here. But it must be also here. It must also be to our spirit. Okay? 
I do believe that it is absolutely important for us to be aware of the challenges that lie before us when we come into a book of the Bible. We have to be aware of it. When we get the background of where a book comes from, uh, we are better able to put ourselves in the shoes of the original readers and hear what God has to say through his prophets. Okay? God is still speaking in this. We just got to put on the right ears to hear it. Okay? The, the historicity of the Bible is vitally important. It is important that we know these things, that we are prepared with these things. Because it reminds us that the Bible did not come about in a vacuum. Rather, John, he was a real person at a real time, writing to real people who were being really attacked by real heretics. That this, this was, this is, this happened. See, First John, it's not like the Book of Mormon that was falsely declared to come from some golden plates. No, First John was, writ, was not written by a false prophet, but by a true prophet, a true apostle of Jesus to combat false prophets. Furthermore, it prepares us, this, learning these things prepares us to be able to give an answer for the hope that is in us when we are confronted by those who deny the faith. I mean, people will hear us, you know, you know we'll, we'll talk about the Bible, and they'll go, like, that's just a myth, right? No, this was real. This wasn't something that, some, that one dude in the, some point after 1000 AD just sat down and wrote everything. But this, this was a this entire book was written over the course of a really long time by real people experiencing real events and seeing God work in real life. And they have, it has been faithfully passed down to us. And so it is important that we know these things, that when somebody comes in and combat, tries to be combative with us and confront us, and say, well, you guys are just a big bunch of idiots. Well, we can go, no, actually... This is all that was going on. And, I, and they might go, well, you're still stupid, and, and leave. So, but it, it's good for us to know these things. Uh, by looking at this background info, we are also made keenly aware of the fact that there is really nothing new under the sun. And that we as the church have constantly seen attacks on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Okay, so it is, is it not interesting that every false teaching that we have seen come down through the ages has been one where a supposed prophet comes and says that they have some knowledge that was either lost or corrupted. And now that very same prophet is the only person whom God is speaking to and using to restore that knowledge. Quite interesting. Is it also not interesting how each and every false religion comes at the behest of its fault that comes at the behest of its false prophet and says the Bible cannot be trusted because it has been corrupted and you need to have their new revelation in order to make sense of the Bible. Hmm. Quite interesting. The devil doesn't really have any new tricks. It was against this sort of devilish uh, chicanery that the Apostle John wrote. Now, praise God in his wisdom that he would give us a book like 1 John that we can read and go, man, that's so apropos for today. Again, the devil has been doing this. Hey, he's been using the same lies since the garden, hath God said. Same thing. Over and over and over again. So as we prepare uh, to dig into First John, may God bless the reading and the preaching of his word. And may he give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive what he has to say in his word. Uh, let us pray.